to welcome Charlotte O'Brien, who is coming from the, um, the York Law School, but also, again, um, I think for those who know her, know that she is, has been a great partner of the CAB, both actually as a worker, but also continuing that partnership, and it's a wonderful example of the work that she's doing, um, feeding into how effective partnerships with external agencies can work um, when they're very much steeped in our ethos. So can I hand over to Charlotte? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak here. Um, we've heard a lot of very inspiring um, stories about the successes of Citizens Advice and Citizens Advice campaigns. Um, I'm, I'm here with a message <laughs> of, of slightly more pessimism. Um, about a project that's currently in the throes of fighting injustice. Um, and uh, doing my best, but coming up against um, a, a, great, a great number of problems, which I'd like to share with you, uh, not just by means of therapy, uh, but <laughs> also because it would be great to inspire you to give me evidence where you possibly can. So, uh, well, the EU Rights Project, what is it and who am I? Uh, well, you've heard I'm an academic, uh, lecture at the University of York. I specialise in EU law, particularly social rights and welfare law, uh, but I have also been advising um, and occupying various roles in the CABs for nearly 12 years now. And this project hopefully brings those two aspects together, the practical experience and the sort of the, the more theoretical and specialist expert knowledge. And I have to say, um, a massive thanks and enormous kudos to uh, Linda Marsden, um, who has been uh, instrumental in facilitating what I think is a very exciting collaboration and has been very forward thinking about letting me do this. Um, so what I do is I bring together casework at formerly Ripon CAB, now the Ripon branch of Craven and Harrogate District CAB. Um, face-to-face -face work with clients. I also get referrals at other bureaus, including New York, and I also second-tier advice work from other bureaus in the northern region and further afield as well. And essentially I do the casework as a normal advisor, um, but slightly more specialist, and so I can take things a bit further than they might otherwise go, helping clients, but also conducting at the same time uh, in terms of parallel ethnography. So documenting the problems that we encounter to create a narrative. Uh, a narrative that's hopefully persuasive at a policy level, who knows, um, but also at an academic level, changing the discourse on, um, on the experiences of EU migrants. And this is where my, my little uh, hokey clip art comes in. That's my ivory tower. My academic ivory tower with a little EU flag on. The ivory tower, uh, where the academics uh, all imagine what EU citizenship is like. And the fact that on paper we all have equal treatment rights now. Discrimination on the grounds of nationality is unlawful, etc., etc. Citizenship is our fundamental destiny. Now, um, as an academic who had had experience of actually working with EU migrants, I knew this to be somewhat flawed premise. Um, and this project is, was dreamed up as an opportunity to test EU citizenship and how strong it was and how strong equal treatment rights were by looking at the experiences of EU migrants. And so it's probably also worth saying that this, uh, this project brings together, hopefully, the different arms of citizens' advice in terms of the advice work and the research and campaigns work. I always use the phrase perfect storm, but that would give completely the wrong impression, very, very negative. A uh, perfect combination. Um, and from a funding point of view, uh, this project is uh, funded mostly by the Economic and Social Research Council, which is a public body, which has enabled me uh, to buy out my teaching for the couple of years while I'm running the project to devote myself to it. Um, someone has pointed out that uh, as a use of public money, it's probably um, in the running for David Cameron's least favourite project. <laughs> <laughs> of which I'm slightly proud. <laughs> um, yes, speaking of uh, the political landscape, 
the particularly eagle-eyed amongst you who are able to read between the lines and pick up on subtle messages may have noticed that EU migrants have been in the news a little bit. Um, the uh, benefits for EU migrants are a bit of a, a, bit of a controversial topic. Um, and I would say for all the wrong reasons. And there's been a lot of perpetuation of prejudice and discriminatory language, uh, which has been uh, deeply problematic. Um, and it's also fed into legislative change, which obviously I hadn't anticipated when I was putting the project together. So it's turned out to be more timely than I originally envisaged because there are more problems being encountered than I expected, more problems that advisors are facing in making sense of the changes, and problems in terms of trying to challenge those changes themselves where I believe they're unlawful. It's timely from an access to justice point of view because of the massively diminished uh, sources of information and support for the clients in question. Uh, there are very few avenues uh, for them to pursue, very few places that they can go to get help. As we know, legal aid for, uh, for welfare has all but dried up, apart from judicial review. And so, in a small way, for a small number of people, uh, this project offers an opportunity to actually challenge injustice and to uncover injustices that would never otherwise see the light of day. And therefore, I think it's, a, it's an important pilot example of what can be done with, uh, with co collaboration between, uh, between specialists and uh, advice agencies. Now, the kinds of obstacles that I'm interested in, well, uh, they, they just complete, uh, they just continue to multiply. There was a plethora of obstacles that I envisaged to start with. The, uh, possibly the biggest, most significant, the biggest stifler of rights is delay. Uh, as the phrase goes, justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, for a lot of EU migrants, if you don't, if you're waiting for a particularly long time, a uh, benefit decision is tantamount to a refusal without a right of appeal. Basically, if you've got a decision, you can appeal it. If you don't have a decision, you can't do anything with it. And you can be waiting and waiting to the point where you become so destitute that you can no longer survive, you may be forced to leave, to go to uh, your home member state, regardless of whether or not you still consider that to be your home, your claim disappears. There are delays in decision making, which are problematic. There are also delays, and this is something in which I think HMRC have seemed to be particularly culpable, in submitting appeals to tribunal. So you can get a decision, and your client is subject to a strict time limit on when they can appeal, your 30 days or a month, and they do their appeal in good time, and then HMRC think, we'll just, we'll just think about this for a while, um, and that while can be several months, or even years. And one thing that we have been pushing with with this project has been supporting people to trigger tribunals to push things on. Because what is not always very widely known is that tribunals do have case management powers, even in cases they've not yet received, <coughs> to issue directions to HMRC and get them to send the appeal to them. So at least the client has an opportunity to have a hearing. However, it's also worth bearing in mind that clerks of tribunals don't always know that the tribunals have this case management power. Um, and so we have to ask for it to be put in front of a judge. And that's one area, one example area, in which I'm doing a little bit of uh, practice campaigning, where I'm requiring tribunals to educate their clients on this. Uh, communication failures. There, there, are, there are too many types to uh, possibly account for all of them. But one major one that I'm interested in here is the problem where the UK authorities decide that they need to contact another member state because someone has come from Poland or Spain, or they have children in Greece, or they um, are resident um, in another member state while working in the UK. And the UK says, well, what we need to do is find out what your benefit entitlement might be in Poland or Spain or Greece or wherever. And so we're going to write to them. And the client basically is given to understand that means your application is going to draw for quite some time. Um, and one of the problems I've discovered is the form that is sent to other member states 
is often not necessarily particularly clearly filled in and doesn't necessarily elicit particularly clear answers from the non-native English speakers from other member states. And so this is an area in which I'm particularly appealing for evidence because I only have a limited number of cases that I've seen with this. But any of you who have cases where you know the UK said, well, we have to send it to Ireland or Greece or wherever, ask to see the form. People don't know that you can see the form. It's an F001 form. Um, and you can see the response. And then you can start pointing out where actually there are inconsistencies. They've referred to the wrong member state. They've referred to the wrong benefit. They've given the client children they don't have, that sort of thing. Um, and, and also, ask for it and then let me know that you've asked for it. Other communication failures. The plague of the invisible decision maker syndrome. Um, <laughs> anyone who's had anything to do with the European decision making team um, in DWP will know that you receive letters from all sorts of strange places, WIC, for instance, uh, with no telephone numbers on. And you can't contact them, and there's a problem with accountability there. And there's also a problem with the, the line of decision making. You get a situation where a client is expected to go to job centre A to hand in some evidence, which then gets sent to job centre B, which gets sent to the income support decision making team, which gets sent to the European decision making team. And it seems a little counterintuitive to me that there isn't a more direct line of communication. And it's also entirely possible for a degree of Chinese whispering to go on, so that the message gets distorted, and plenty of opportunities for the documents to get lost. Problems with the helpline, <laughs> the automated voice recognition helpline. I despise these at the best of times. But uh, when you find yourself screaming at the phone, no, child, benefit! And then they say, did you say Charles tax credit? <laughs> and then just hang up on you anyway or you get caught in a loop. It's very frustrating. And especially frustrating for clients who have a tiny amount of time perhaps in their breaks to make these phone calls and may have more pronounced accent than me. And therefore make it more difficult to get it through. There are plenty more obstacles. Uh, document black holes, things going missing, uh, correspondence, ID. This can be deeply problematic because of the heavy evidential burdens that are placed on clients. They're expected to produce all sorts of evidence that can be quite disproportionate to the decision that's being made. And then it seems there are questionable, there is a questionable duty of care being taken over those documents, particularly ID documents that are difficult to replace. And then they disappear, and then what do you do? And then you get a letter saying you must send it again, even though you've already sent it. It's no wonder that I've spoken to a number of people who have described the system as quite Kafkaesque. And letters going missing. And letters being addressed to the wrong person or the wrong address instead of to the client. And somehow it's always the client who suffers as a consequence. Compliance and sanctions. So the issue of compliance procedures being triggered almost routinely or without obvious cause in the case of EU violence is difficult, problematic. In theory, according to the rules, compliance procedures should be triggered where there is a reason for suspecting that something is wrong with a HMRC award. For instance, if you suspect that the client has in some way misled you. Now, if simply being an EU migrant were to be seen as grounds for suspecting something is wrong, that would be discriminatory. And I was initially quite curious to find out how many, as a proportion of the population, of EU migrants were subject to compliance procedures. However, a document was issued by the Treasury earlier this year to suggest that they will now be routinely, now whether or not this has started to happen, I don't know, whether or not it's going, when it's going to happen, they're routinely going to issue compliance procedures for all claims of all EU migrants, working or not. Which, I suppose it's quite helpful of the government to just make explicit what I suspected all along. Um, but it is difficult to justify that kind of discriminatory treatment which would be an infringement of EU law. So again, I'm very interested to hear about what your experiences are on that front. Sanctions. Uh, there are reasons for suspecting that EU migrants may be more susceptible to sanctions than UK nationals, particularly 
following one of the changes we'll look at in a second, which is the withdrawal of interpretation at Job Centre Plus, which means migrants are less likely to understand their, their responsibilities. Misdirection, uh, that's my euphemism, uh, but people basically being told the wrong thing by Job Centre Plus or HMRC. Being told to apply for something, to stop applying for one benefit and apply for another that they're not going to get, that's going to lead to a welfare cliff edge and lead to all the dominoes coming down. The classic example, uh, lone parents being told to stop applying for JSA, apply for income support, and do that, and then their housing benefit stops, and then they end up facing concession proceedings, etc., etc. Or the reverse in some ways, being told outright, no, you're not, not going to be entitled to X, Y, or Z because of these new rules, so don't apply. A lot of gatekeeping, whereas actually, there are cases in which I would suggest, regardless of what the rules say, the client should be applying and should be challenging those rules. Poor decision making. People not getting the right information to begin with in order to make the decisions, basing it on the wrong rules. Decision makers themselves refuse the phrase that I encountered when I spoke with the decision maker, uh, when I was pointing out that something they had done was contrary to a particular statute, they said, well, we're not allowed to look at the law. <laughs> <laughs> Which, when you're dealing with people who are implementing the law, again, seems bizarre. It's all, it's all slightly Alice in Wonderland-esque. Um, so, again, how, how on earth is that going to create informed decision-making? And we need better avenues of challenging that. And, of course, the hardship that all of these things cause is a... a of research interest and of, of importance as well in order to be able to demonstrate why these things matter. And that's partly uh, important as well for what I'm about to talk about, which is the new rules. There have been a lot of new welfare changes for everybody. <coughs> and so the question could you know, legitimately be posed, so why should we care about the rules for EU migrants in particular? And the answer, I think, lies in the consequences, the hardship, EU migrants are pushed very readily and quickly into positions of destitution. And that, I think, reflects very poorly upon us as a society, as a civilised society, especially when we're dealing with families, when we're dealing with children. We are effectively assuming that there is no safety net. And it's all very well describing the, the difference between the workers, the virtuous workers, and uh, the scrounging way about non work and we, we already know that that distinction, that bifurcation, is flawed, is problematic, is wrong in the context of UK nationals. And yet there is somehow a readier acceptance of it in the context of EU nationals. Whereas we know that people move in and out of work all the time. That we're much more likely to be subject to atypical contracts, zero hours contracts, etc. So there will be a couple of gaps in between. That doesn't necessarily mean they should just be classified as worthless non-people as soon as they become unemployed, and that their children should be uh, similarly uh, devalued. Right, so the first new rule, or you can see the, the headline, the, the telling headline in David Cameron's article in the Financial Times in November last year, uh, which was where he announced uh, that there would be this welfare practical. Uh, free movement within Europe needs to be less free. The implication there is it's not really just about the benefits. The benefits are a symptom. It's, it's actually about repelling EU migrants, which has all sorts of unsavoury undertones of, 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 let's face it, UK pandering. Um, the, this idea that EU migrants ought to be repelled from, from our shores for one reason or another. And the first rule that was introduced was the three month wait for job seekers allowance. This assumption uh, that EU migrants were arriving and immediately going straight to the job centre claiming JSA. And we should stop that from happening, they should wait for three months. Now, I haven't seen any evidence, and in the uh, documents that were produced, the impact assessment, etc., uh, it was conspicuously absent of evidence that this was a problem in the first place. All of the costs, all of the benefits were listed as 000, NA, NA, NA. We can't possibly predict because we don't know how many people are doing this in the first place. What we can say is that a big impact has been felt by UK nationals by this new rule, which is slightly perverse. But UK nationals who've been to another EU member state and come back 
have always been told that they, or I say always, since a, since a case, a uh, European Court of Justice case, uh, more than a decade ago, have been told they should be capable of being habitually resident straight away. They can be subject to a HAPRES test, but they should be able to sit that as soon as they come back, because otherwise they've been penalised for going and working in another member state. As the new rule says, no, UK nationals must also wait for three months when they come back, even if they've been going to another EU member state and working, if it's been lo longer than, uh, I can't remember the exact, the exact time, but three months about, then they must sit and wait. And we, I've presented this argument to the DWP to no avail so far, and I'm currently challenging through litigation, through a couple of tribunal cases, this rule. The exclusion of EU job seekers from housing benefit, very problematic, affects not just new job seekers, but all EU job seekers. So anyone who has been working and then for some reason or another has not retained their worker status. And for, rule, for reasons I won't go into now, it has proven increasingly difficult for EU migrants to retain worker status when they lose their job, especially if they're in a situation on a zero hours contract for some reason and therefore they may have waited a little bit too long before they sign on. And here we see EU migrants being penalised for not being too quick to take up benefits. If they have survived on their own resources, kept on looking for work and failed to find it, they will lose worker status, unlike if they were paying in jail so. And then they become treated as job seekers, and that means they lose their housing benefit now, ever since March this year. And that affects a number of families as well and particularly lone parents. So families where there has been a migrant worker and then the relationship has broken down for one reason or another, sometimes to do with domestic violence. And we see lone parent or people facing an appalling choice. Do they stay with the abuser? Do they keep their children with the abuser? Or do they break the relationship and end up destitute and homeless? because as soon as they leave that person, they are found not to be connected to a migrant worker anymore. They can claim JSA, but they won't get housing benefit. A quarter of the people affected by this rule have, fam have families, have children. And the impact assessment of this found that there would be a disproportionate effect on lone parent families, but said it will be okay because they can claim JSA. There's a massive rent shortfall between JSA, your £75 a week if you're a lone parent, and your, your rent rates, your local housing allowance, which may be uh, anything like £160 in the Haribus area if you've got two children of uh, different sexes from above the age of 10. A massive rent shortfall without even accounting for paying for anything else. So what happens? Are going, people, these families becoming homeless? Well, Again, the document said, well, social services can help out, but we don't envisage any extra costs for social services. So really, social services aren't helping out. Social services are offering to ship people back home, home, in inverted commas. Bearing in mind, these are people who've often lived here for a long time. They have been living and working for, for years, for decades even, but if they just, for one reason or another, don't qualify for permanent residence, which is difficult to get, they still have those years of work completely discounted and treated as someone to be booted out. The six month test, now you get booted off JSA if you've been on it for six months, unless you can produce compelling evidence of a genuine prospect of work. In EU law, you're entitled to, a member state is entitled to ask that someone has a genuine chance of work after six months. A genuine chance. It does not say anything about probability. The UK rules or the decision making guidance on this takes this a little bit, I would say, quite a lot too far. It's a very narrow description of what counts as compelling evidence of a genuine prospect of work. Now you can tell me whether or not you think this counts as a genuine chance of work if you can produce a written job offer with a start date and hours and pay. And what, what's, what's even more bizarre is that if you can produce a written job offer with a start date, but it doesn't specify your exact hours and it doesn't specify your exact pay because it's a zero hours contract, it doesn't count. That job offer, that job contract, is not evidence of a chance of work. Now again, 
how, how the logic of this uh, slightly, slightly defies me. Um, but there is another way of showing that you have a genuine uh, chance of work, compelling evidence, and that's to point to a change in circumstances within the last two months that makes imminent employment, imminent employment likely, and you're awaiting the outcome of drug interviews. Again, that suggests massive, massively high likelihood, and very, very, I haven't come across a client who fits into that criterion yet. So I'm very interested in finding out about people who have fallen foul of the genuine prospects of work test, and the kinds of evidence that are being refused and disregarded, I believe, contrary to EU law. More new rules may just keep on coming, one after another. Uh, the three-month wait for JSA has been extended to child tax credit and child benefit. Uh, job Centre Plus interpretation, routine interpretation, has been withdrawn. The rationale for this, according to the, the government's policy document, is it will encourage EU migrants to learn English and therefore become more employable, uh, and therefore will encourage integration, and uh, is, is in their in interests entirely. It does not really engage with the problem that if people do not understand their responsibilities, they may fail, and they may be like, more likely to be subject to sanctions. If they can't communicate properly, they may just become disaffected, and they may not engage, and they may not be getting the benefits to which they're entitled. The minimum earnings threshold. Now, get this on paper, appears to be fine. This idea that, okay, we'll see if someone is earning £153 a week or more, they will be treated as a migrant worker automatically. But if they're earning less, then we'll see whether or not their work is genuine and effective. So you won't be ruled out. Now, my concern is that actually the threshold, the £153, will be treated as basically determinative. That this idea that people will be looked at in more detail if they're earning less is uh, optimistic and misleading. Because of the guidance that's been issued that suggests that the threshold is, is what in, is important. Because of the, um, the press releases from the government which has suggested that it's the threshold that what is important. And I'm seeing now uh, decision making guidance coming from local authorities as well, suggesting that it's this £153 a week is what is important. And that is problematic because it massively disadvantages part-time workers. People who are uh, for instance, um, balancing childcare and work, who the European Court of Justice recognises, whom part-time work represents an important means of improving their standard of living and should be recognised as work. But we're in danger of finding people who are workers, who are in work, not to be workers. And if they're found not to be workers, they'll be found to be job seekers, regardless of the fact that they're working. And if they're job seekers, they won't be entitled to housing benefits. And so we'll see young parents who are working being booted off housing benefits and facing eviction, which is, which is problematic. Another major problem with the, with the guidance on the minimum earning threshold is to do with looking at past work. Is past work genuine work? And apparently, decision makers are being invited to, um, to consider whether someone's physical capacity for work is sufficient and whether or not they were effectively too disabled to have done the job and therefore weren't workers. Um, I can see a number of faces screwing up there, quite rightly so. It's it invites spurious, ad hoc, retrospective assessments of someone's physical capability. It has no reference to occupational health assessments, to the employer's duties to make reasonable adjustments at all. It's contrary to the principle of um, disability equality, and yet it's been crystallised into the guidance that you may not be doing genuine and effective work if you were too disabled for the job. Right, so these are all these problems. What, what is the project doing about all of these things? Well, up to a point, just kind of um, shouting into the void and swimming against the tide, um, and that's how it feels sometimes. <coughs> I'm documenting the difficulties that the clients are facing, so I'm creating hopefully quite powerful narratives. Helping clients where I can, so help it, I've managed to help some clients avoid uh, eviction, challenge eviction proceedings successfully, to uh, challenge over payments successfully, to uh, get benefit payments made, to establish permanent residence, those sorts of things, which are all quite important and successful measures, particularly for, for families as well. 
identifying new claims. So this is particularly important in the administrative obstacle work. So where I'm finding that there are significant repeated problems with delay, with documents going missing, et cetera, et cetera, and compiling evidence on possible discrimination claims, indirect discrimination on the grounds of nationality, possible judicial review claims, and working with other organisations on putting those together. So the Child Poverty Action Group at the Air Centre. Producing challenges. So this is where, while trying to be as reasonable as possible, um, I am making myself as much of a pain in the proverbial as possible to the powers that be. So those challenges can be to the organisations, DWP, HMRC, through their complaints procedures, challenges to the parliamentary ombudsman, challenges to the European Commission, where I believe infringements have occurred. Now the problems that I'm encountering there are that quite a lot of the time I need, I need information that I don't have, where I suspect that something is happening systematically. And so I have been submitting a number of freedom of information requests to HMRC, for instance, on the number of claims they see that do X and the number of claims that result in Y. So that can demonstrate that actually there is a problem with hardly ever utilising, for instance, an interim payment option, that clients are systematically being excluded. And almost always I get the response, to, to provide you with this information would just take far too much time, so we can't do it. So uh, I think I'm going to be in the position of trying to employ, <laughs> utilise the services of willing MPs to push for this a little bit further. But th those challenges are important because I think one of the major ways of course I'm creating challenges is through litigation. And this is what I meant when I said we shouldn't just be writing clients off and saying, look, these are the rules, therefore you're not going to be entitled. If you have if you encounter anything that falls into the categories I've been discussing today, please get in contact with me and I will help if I can. If I think there are grounds for challenging the rule in question with drafting an appeal and with putting an appeal together that will challenge the rules. So rather than saying, no, you're not going to get it because you've not been here for three months, you're not going to get housing benefit because you're a job seeker. Maybe they're not, but that doesn't stop you putting in a claim to challenge the rule because where the rules need to be challenged, where we believe there are possibilities of domestic courts overruling the rules, that's worth pushing, or possibilities of domestic courts referring to the European Court of Justice to say, look, is this really what the EU treaty is about? and also producing and advising EU migrants toolkit. So the kinds of things that I'm encountering and the strategies that I'm discovering and utilising, I'm putting them all together into a toolkit that will be hopefully useful to generalist advisors. And I've been in discussion with, uh, with Citizens Advice um, nationally about having links to it in the information system. So that, that would hopefully be a excellent use to a number of people. But again, it all depends on having as much evidence as possible. So whether you want to make referrals to me, if you want second tier advice, or you just have evidence on the things that I've, I've discussed, then please throw it all in my direction, because the more material I have, the better this toolkit will be. And thank you for your time. Those are my contact details. <laughs>